Today we're going to take a look at creating depth or space in our painting, which is really important because we work on a flat surface or canvas or boards or two-dimensional and we want to create the feeling of them being three-dimensional. So when we're painting, we have to be really conscious of creating that space, separating the background, middle ground, foreground. So it's not just a matter of um, copying a photograph or even if you're outside, just trying to copy what's there, you gotta be really aware of creating that space and, and how to do it. So we're gonna take a look at about 12 paintings here by Hanson Putoff. He was an early California Impressionist, uh, born in 1875, died in 1972. But the first part of his career, he was a commercial artist. He painted billboards, posters, and this is one of them here. As you can see, being a billboard or sign painter back then meant you really had to know how to paint. It wasn't just a matter of doing letters. He really had a really good grasp of landscape painting. So when he quit the commercial jobs and went to painting full time, he wasn't starting from zero. He really knew how to paint. So let's take a look at his paintings and we'll kind of figure out what he's thinking to create depth in the painting. I think number one thing is value range. To create the idea of space, things receding and going back, you have to get your darks, which are darker in the foreground, gradually getting lighter as they go back. And that creates feeling of space. If the darks way back in here are just as dark as up here, it's gonna flatten out your painting. So be really aware, and in photographs, a lot of times, you wanna create more difference between the dark and the light. In other words, make your background darks even a bit lighter to create that, that sense of depth. Because the photographs, a lot of times, will flatten out the darks and they'll all seem the same as they recede. But same thing with the lights. See the green here in the foreground? gets a little bit lighter. Of course, the grass is different. and The angles on the hills are a bit different, which also creates some value change. But generally speaking, and these are very general rules, they're always gonna be broken in certain instances, but generally the lights will also, because of the atmosphere, moisture in the air, lights and the darks become a little less than as they recede. So lights getting a bit lighter, and both of them color-wise are becoming less saturated, less intense. So value in color becomes less than they are as things recede and go into the distance. The other thing here, as those values recede, you want to compare. So I have my darkest, or I, I don't, Hansen does, his darkest darks are up front here in the tree trunks and the dark accents in front. They get a little bit lighter back in here and a little lighter, yes, there back in there. And of course, light is back in in the background, but it's not just a matter of making the background mountains lighter by adding a bunch of white. It's comparing the value changes. So to get this the right value, I need to compare with the mountain in front of it and or compare with the sky. How much darker the mountain is than the sky and how much lighter this mountain is than this mountain. So always comparing not just making something lighter and darker because you want it to go in the background. Same thing up in front, I'll compare the difference that I'm seeing um, in the lights and the darks back in here compared to up front. And I might want to push it a bit more to create more depth or paint it as I see it, but either way, you're, you're comparing. It's not just a matter of making things uh, lighter with a bunch of white. Now the other thing is to key the value of our painting. So if we think of um, value range like from one to seven, uh, let's say seven being the lightest and one being the darkest value. I'm gonna pick a range of values, or I can pick a range of values and kind of de determine what that range is gonna be. So in this painting, uh, put off has kind of a higher value range. In other words, his darks are not as dark 
So if one is darkest, his values are about a three or four in here. They're not as dark as they could be. And they get lighter, these darks get lighter as they recede and go back. So he's intentionally made the, all the darks a bit lighter. Same thing with the lights. These lights are really light. Instead of being nine, uh, the lightest light, um, the lightest light is, is close to the higher range. So everything is lighter and higher. These lights here are your darkest lights. So all the values, dark and light, are higher on the value scale. And that's called a higher key. And you can do the opposite as well. Well, this is also another high key. California, you have that atmosphere, the fog moving in from the ocean, and it really settles in and you get really, really high values. You also get really high values when you're looking into the sunlight, when everything is backlit. But this is more fog or atmospheric. Um, again, where the darkest darks are fairly light for shadows and the lights are really light. So everything is higher on the value scale. And you can do the opposite. Have everything lower. The darks a lot darker. More like two or three for some of these real dark darks. And then the lights for the most part are darker also. A lot of these lights are, you know, fairly dark because everything is lower on the value scale. So it helps to be aware of that, uh, knowing that when I look into the sunlight or it's a foggy day, I know my darks aren't going to be as dark. And same thing late afternoon where the sun is real strong, hitting the lights and the shadows are real dark because of the long shadows, that they can be a, a lower key, everything just a bit, a bit darker. Helps to understand that as well. Now on this one, the atmospheric perspective here is really affecting the values and colors. The, there's more moisture in the air. Things are a bit more hazy. The problem with that is you have like these sunlit cliffs back in here and I have to make them look sunlit, but at the same time I have to make them recede. Colors tend to get cooler as they recede. So I might have a lot of blue, blue-violet in whatever color the mountains or trees are way in the distance, but I still have to think about showing them in the sunlight or in the shadow. And in the shadow in the distance, fairly easy. They're going to be darker or lighter shadows, again, because they're way in the distance, and cooler color. But the same thing with the light. It's still sunlit cliff here, and I have to show it warm, but I have to have enough cool color in there also to make it recede and stay back in the distance. And again, the key is relationship. How much warmer and brighter the sunlit on the tops of these shrubberies are and how much darker the shadows are in the foreground and the shadows in the, in the background. Now, this is another kind of a low key value. Uh, darks are pretty dark, really dark here in the foreground and then gradually getting lighter as they recede. And the lights here, fairly dark also. The one thing about having a lower key value, in other words, all your values getting a little bit darker, both dark and light, is that you have richer color because you don't have to add as much white to it. Um, where here and here, you can see I'm adding, a, or I'm not, Hanson is, adding a lot of white to these values and that kind of knocks the color down a little bit. White will kill the color, whereas if you don't add as much white and you get a lower key painting, values are darker, you can have more color, richer color. Which is why on a cloudy day where it's overcast, your colors are going to be a bit richer than they are on a bright sunny day. It doesn't seem that way. You would think a bright sunny day colors are going to be a lot richer, but they're not because you have to add white to them to get the values lighter in the sunlight. Whereas on a cloudy day, I don't have to add as much white to the grass here or the um, light greens on the trees. So the colors would be a lot, a lot richer. And here we have another uh, problem with showing depth is here you have shadowed foreground 
and a sunlit background. So the warmer colors are in the background and the cooler colors are in the foreground, which is just the opposite when you think about showing depth. Colors gradually get cooler as they recede and they're gradually warmer as they come forward. But here, because the cast shadow comes across the foreground, I'm gonna have a little bit cooler colors here and I'm gonna have my warmer colors, more sunlit colors in the background. And that goes against the idea of creating the illusion of depth. But the key is, I think in the foreground here, these colors are all a lot warmer, even though they're in shadow. There's a lot more oranges and reds in these greens here and less so back in here. Also, the shadows are a lot warmer back in here and the shadows back in here are a lot cooler, a lot more blues. Plus they're lighter, so lighter and cooler shadows darker, warmer shadows in the foreground are always going to create a sense of depth. It can get confusing when you're, you know, you have your basic rules of things getting lighter, um, color getting cooler as it goes back, but again, it can always change. And this is another one where you have the cool shadow in the foreground and the warm sunlight in back. One thing that helps me is to realize that um, my background sunlight is always going to be a little less than if I had that sunlight up front. So I can kind of imagine what this would look like sunlit and make sure this is a little less than that. Not quite as intense or saturated color. And I can always drag a little bit of cool color in the sunlit colors just to knock them down a little bit. But again, the shadows are a lot cooler in the background. Shadows are warmer in the foreground. I mean, these shadows are still cool compared to sunlit tree, but they're a lot warmer compared to the background shadows back in there. So the rules are made to be broken, but it always helps to understand them really well first. So you know why you're, you're breaking that rule of warm and cool colors and dark and light values. Now in this one, of course, it's got the real dark darks in front, which really separate from the background. You can see how light the shadows are back here and how dark the shadows are up here. But the other thing is the background is so simple. He's got a lot of value change in this tree. There's little darks and lights, real dark, dark, real light, warm lights. So a lot of contrast of value and contrast of temperature. Or in the background, it's, everything's fairly cool and there's not many value changes. Um, so keeping the background more simple, not trying to do too much back in there really creates a sense of depth. The more simple I can keep the background and keep all my detail and busyness in the foreground, the more sense of depth I'm gonna, gonna create. Here's another one here where the background kept very simple, two to three values. It's got two values in the light, pretty much one value in the shadow. And here in the foreground, he's got a lot more smaller value changes, a lot darker darks, more intense or saturated color. Everything in the background kind of sinks into that bluish, really bluish green, a blue green that's more on the blue side than it is on the green side, but still a bit of ochre in that blue to keep it a little bit on the blue green side. But the value change, the value relationships here really separate well. Hope that makes uh, sense, the idea of creating depth in there. And if you would uh, like and subscribe, appreciate that. And we'll see you next time.